so much for having me in. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I don't get to do any teaching anymore, so um, really, really nice to, to get the opportunity to be with you all. Um, as you've heard, my name is Helen Brown. I'm a principal advisor at the Behavioral Insight Team. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we do and who we are as we go through, but again, happy to answer any questions. And also happy to speak to career options, if that is of interest. Um, I started with an academic, have now moved to policy, um, and so happy to, to talk about that if that's of interest. So um, today, as I mentioned, I'll cover a few things. Um, so I'll start off with a brief, super brief info to BIT, the Behavioral Insights team, um, who we are, where we come from, and our current mission. I'll then give you like a one slide on dual process theory. Um, your economists, your public policy people, you will know this already, so it'll just be a quick refresher. Um, and then I'll spend the majority of our time talking about EAST, which is the framework we use to apply behavioral insights to design behavioral interventions. Um, and I'll do that specifically focused on health and then specifically focused on the NHS, just to give us an area of, of concentration. So a little bit about BIT. Um, we started life under the coalition government in 2010 um, as the world's first, I guess, government unit dedicated to applying insights from economics, uh, psychology, other behavioural sciences to public policy. Um, since then, we have spun out of government um, and we're now wholly owned by the innovation charity Nesta. Um, so we still sit uh, very close to central government, we have offices in Westminster and um, on the embankment, but we're now part of the Nesta group. We also have offices around the world, um, so I'm not sure if you can see, we have done projects in 77 countries, we have seven international offices, um, and then a couple of additional countries with a local presence. Um, and this is wildly out of date, I think the number is now around 1500. Uh, behavioural clients and experimentation projects. So whenever I talk about behavioural insights team and the nudge unit and us, um, people always ask what behavioural insights are. Um, and so this is the way I like to characterise it. It's really the application of scientific methods, so economic psychology, other behavioural sciences, to really understand how people make choices, how they uh, respond to their environment, how they're making decisions in everyday life. And so we can better understand the factors that are driving human behaviour. And in doing so, the idea here is that we take this evidence, we take this knowledge uh, to develop really effective interventions and policies um, to help people change their behaviour or to continue doing behaviours that are supportive and effective for them. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. I'm just ignoring people, am I? Um, <laughs> okay. Keep interrupting. That's fine. Um, so, yeah, applying uh, insights from those sort of scientific disciplines to public policy is really the core of what we do. In recent years, we have also shifted to be sort of experimentation nags, I guess. Um, so, anyone who spends more than five minutes in my company will certainly hear me talk about testing, iterating, testing again. Um, and that's something, particularly in our work with government, that we try to bring in. So whenever we're setting up a new policy, whenever we're thinking about an intervention, how can we ensure the data are available and the experimental, kind of the study design is in place, if you like. Um, so insights to policy and experimentation, that's what we, that's what we do. Oh, I've tried to move this, but it's not. Right now, hang on. Let me just. Come back. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I can. Okay, great. How did that work for no, you? And not just for that. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this is really important because uh, public policy, of course, is inherently behavioral. So, whenever we want to encourage any of these critical behaviors for public good, for societal good, uh, we need to think about changing behavior. And of course, what I do is focused uh, pretty much solely on health, but all of these behaviours and many, many more that sit within uh, sort of government remit, charity remit, policy remit, um, they will require humans to do a thing. And when you need humans to do a thing, you need to apply a really realistic model of human behaviour. And that's what we that's what we try to do. And we do this through uh, the lens of Danny Kahneman, of course. 
um, uh, and think about dual process theory. So, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, Danny Kahneman, Nobel Laureate in Economics, uh, Behavioral Economics, um, who condensed an entire uh, field of thinking into a really neat and simple theory. Um, and so we have two systems. We have our reflective system, in which we're being very slow, we're being very rational, and we're analysing the information in front of us. And we also have our automatic system, in which we are just responding in an automatic, sort of on autopilot, in an intuitive way. And these two systems are really important for public policy, because what we find is that when policymakers and governments and, and other organisations make policy, they often think that we're acting in this sort of reflective system, right? So they assume, okay, I'm coming to a GP surgery, taking in all the information, and I'm making the right choice for me. I'm not doing that at all. I'm probably thinking about 20 other things. I'm panicking because I'm late. Uh, I'm worried about my health. You know, all of this stuff is happening. And so that puts me in this sort of automatic, intuitive response state. And this is really how we move through the world. And so this is how we need to design public policy, taking that more realistic model of human behavior into account. And so much of our work really looks at shifting policy from our reflective to our automatic system. And so to try and do that and to try and shape or think about how we might do that, we, um, I think, really very early on developed the EAST framework. Um, and for anyone who's worked with BIT or seen any BIT work, uh, you will certainly have heard this, um, this sort of idea before. And it really, if you leave with nothing else, um, it should be this. So if you would like to encourage a behaviour, we need to make it easy, attractive, social, and timely. So easy, attractive, social, and timely. And what I'll do now is I'm going to take you through each of these ideas um, and share an example study specific to the NHS um, for, for each of those ideas. So we'll kick off with easy. And there are a few things we can do to try and make either processes, practice, uh, policy, um, admin. <laughs> we can make it as easy as possible. So the first thing is to set intelligent defaults. Um, and we know that defaults actually are incredibly powerful. Um, so you may have seen work over the last couple of years on organ donation, you would think an incredibly uh, sort of mindful, thought through decision. We know that's not true when people are defaulted into either donating or not, they tend to follow the status quo or literally the form that's in front of them. So if we want to encourage a behavior, we can often set defaults on forms or admin uh, to, try and, to try and do so. We can also try to reduce friction. Um, and I always try to, <laughs> It's terrible, but I always reference Amazon in this scenario. Um, I can go, it's like three clicks, and I bought 15 things on Amazon because they have reduced and reduced and simplified and simplified to ensure that it is as easy as possible for me to do the behavior that they're looking for, which is to spend my money. Um, and so we can try to reduce friction as much as possible. That even goes as simply as, I don't know, if we're a GP surgery and we want to encourage people to sign up or to cancel or book or reschedule their appointment, should be a one-click link in the text message that you receive. Shouldn't have to faff around, typing in URLs, uh, should be as easy as possible. So reducing friction is a really powerful way uh, that we can, we can make things easy. And of course, we can simplify messages. And this is really important, particularly for health and health inequalities, uh, because if we make things too complicated, we risk marginalizing those who need our help the most. So to demonstrate the sort of power of making things easy, um, I want to talk about a trial we did a couple of years ago now, um, aiming to reduce prescribing errors in clinical seconds. And we know that prescribing errors are incredibly common. So approximately one in 14 prescriptions that are uh, generated today will have an error on there somewhere. Now, not all of those will result in a clinical, uh, a clinical outcome or a clinical problem, but many of those will. So it's a really big problem and something that, to be honest, should be, should be solvable. And so we were tasked to have a look at what we can do. And so we looked at the form uh, that busy clinicians in a &E, uh, were using to prescribe or to um, note down the medications that patients needed when they were, when they were referred. Um, and this is what we found. So... <laughs> 
incredibly reliant on doctor's handwriting, um, which is notoriously terrible. Uh, we have it's sort of free text you can see for the dose uh, and for the unit of, um, of the prescription, and also no prompt for the doctor, for example, to put their page number, to give any additional information, just incredibly lax um, in the way that the form itself is, is set up. And so we made some really simple uh, changes, so not rocket science, uh, to the form. So you can see we required uh, not the written out dose uh, or the unit rather, uh, but we required this to be circled. Uh, we gave a prompt here for the pager number. Uh, we had lots of boxes that made things super clear where you're supposed to put things um, and how you should be reporting your prescriptions. And what we found, of course, um, was that this was incredibly powerful. We saw an increase, um, and all of these are statistically significant, an increase in the doses that were entered correctly, the, the number of contact numbers that were provided, and really critically, the times that the medication frequency was entered correctly. And this is really just for there's a person who yeah. got it. I'm all over it. Um, and so this is really critical because this is just a change to the form. Zero cost. Uh, a little bit of hassle, but once it's done, it's done. And we saw some incredible um, results. And this is really what um, I think nudge and behavioral science and behavioral economics in particular is so brilliant for. Small changes, enormous impact. So uh, making things attractive, um, lots of ideas here borrowed from marketing and social marketing. Um, some of the things we can think about with respect to the health, um, the health system, drawing attention to specific features of service, so making things that are very important to us very salient. We can personalize messages, um, so we all know we're much more likely to respond to a letter or an email if it says, Dear Helen, um, as opposed to Dear Sir, to whom it may concern, any of that. Um, so we can try and personalise where possible. And of course, within the health system, we have data to, to do this. So should be doable, should be possible. And of course, we can think about incentive structures. We can think about how to provide incentives um, to encourage any specific behaviour. And so uh, to really speak to this, I want to share a study that we um, conducted during the pandemic, so in April 21. Uh, so in April 21, you might remember that eligibility for the vaccine was extended to those aged between 40 and 44. Uh, so really the height of the vaccine rolled out. Um, so we worked with DH, NHS and what was then PHE uh, to conduct a very, very large scale field experiment. And the idea here was to identify which text message was likely to elicit highest booking rates. So how can we make those text messages as salient, as personal, as attractive, and elicit the behavior that we were, we were looking to see? And so the trial had two and a half million people, so one of the largest um, vaccination trials in the world. Um, and you can see that, uh, well, everyone, not participants, the public, were randomized to receive one of eight text messages. So we had the control message, which, um, was already being shared with other cohorts. Then we had a, a sort of simplified version. We then had a reserved version. Um, so you can see the vaccine's waiting for you, please book. We had a uh, top of the queue, so you've reached the top of the queue uh, message. We encouraged people to join the millions. Uh, we focused on convenience, thinking, okay, let's reduce friction, let's make it easy. And then we had two messages that focused on protection against the virus. So protecting against the virus for yourself, but then also for those close to you. And these messages uh, were shared with um, that cohort, so the 40 to 44 year olds, um, to really identify which was likely to be the best performing message. And we discovered um, that the British love a queue. Um, so the top of the queue and the reserved messages performed not hugely better, but statistically significantly better uh, than the control group um, and resulted in an increase of, um, of those booking their, their vaccination appointments. Again, I do always like to highlight this, the join the millions message actually had a very slight backfire, um, only just significant, but slight nonetheless. 
Um, and so again, it gives a real implication of why it's so critical um, that we test, we iterate, we test again. So using this uh, information, the top of the Q message was then rolled out to those 30 to those seven and then 20 to 25. Um, and we saw the same results again. So we had validation that actually that really was the, the text message that performed best and encouraged the behavior that we were, we were looking to see. And I think the key thing here is that, I mean, I'm joking that the British love a cue, but actually what we were able to do is identify what's attractive to the people we're looking to influence and how can we get that across and encourage a specific behavior. Can, so, can we ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 difference, the differences here are very marginally significant. Mm -hmm. no, no. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, 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 yeah so tiny. The only one that really is marginally significant is just jumping the queue. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Um, so it's, it's literally one, and it will be like status related, right? So people like to that's have right. status, to, yeah, to be told right. that they are like above someone else. Yeah. Right? And I think also one of the other things I think is interesting here is that we've done a lot of work on operational transparency for health services. So I don't have slides on it today, but we did a piece on the IAP service, which is accessing psychological therapies, and we sent text messages whilst people were in the queue, basically, and said, okay, you're number 50, you're number 20, and we found that really increased engagement. And I think there's something about that movement along the queue that really taps into the psyche of people, especially in a high-stress scenario like, like a pandemic. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll keep moving through, but do interrupt me. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end. Um, so the next uh, sort of idea that we, or the, the um, bucket of ideas that we speak to is making something social. And this really taps into many uh, classic ideas from social psychology. And so for example, uh, we can think about leveraging the reciprocity effect. I think this is so powerful. Um, nothing worse than when somebody invites you for dinner, because you know you don't have to invite them back. Um, and I think this that type of idea can be uh, replicated really nicely in, um, in public policy. So we can say, we've reserved some things for you, come and take it up, giving that idea of reciprocity. We can also use the power of existing social networks, particularly thinking about social norms and encouraging uh, people to do the same thing as those like them. We know that can be, can be super powerful. Um, and again, we can highlight helpful social norms. And so the example I'm going to speak to here is really around uh, reducing unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Um, and so a couple of years ago, uh, maybe 18 months ago, we were um, tarred when well, we have a big program of work on antimicrobial resistance, um, which we know is increasingly problematic, both in this country, but worldwide. Um, the Lancet, uh, the Lancet um, latest figures suggest that antimicrobial resistance will cause 10 million excess deaths uh, by 2050. That's, that's a 50 under there uh, worldwide and something that is absolutely preventable. So we decided to uh, throw the behavioral science book at it. Um, and we came up with a letter that would take into account a few different um, insights from behavioral science and try to discourage um, very high prescribing GPs. So the top 20% of GPs uh, prescribing multiple prescriptions um, at an unnecessary rate, we tried to target just those people. So we identified them and we sent them all just once this letter. So you can see we did a few things. Uh, we leveraged social norms. So you can see the great majority of practices in Birmingham prescribe fewer antibiotics per head than yours. We kept that up really nice upfront in bold. And then we also uh, thought about the messenger effect. So we know that if we like a person, if we respect them, if we uh, want to be like them, if we can um, see ourselves in them, if we can relate to them, we're much more likely to follow their guidance and their advice. Um, and so in this case, we uh, drew on Professor Dame Sally Davies, uh, who was CMO at the time, uh, to, to really sign off the letters. A load of logos at the top increase the legitimacy of the, of the letters. And so here are the, uh, the prescription rates of the control group, so the, the match control GP practices that did not receive letters. Um, and you can see the usual kind of um, prescription pattern with a, a, a sort of spike 
over the winter. And then here we have the, uh, the rates for those in treatment groups, so those receiving the letters. And overall, there was a 3.3% reduction in prescription rates for those uh, receiving their letters versus those without. And what's really neat here is that we employed a weightless control design, and so we saw a convergence of rates uh, once we sent everybody the letters. So we can be really confident in this case that that one letter uh, made an enormous difference to the prescribing behaviours of those really sort of uh, high prescribing GPs. How sustained was that effect? Sorry? How sustained was that effect? I knew you were going to ask that. So we weren't funded to follow up, um, so we don't know. Um, I would love to know, but we don't know. Um, we do know that prescription rates remain high, um, but we have no way of knowing um, specific to those practices, unfortunately. If you can find some funding for me to follow up, that would be amazing. Um, because I think this is really neat. So the intervention itself um, saved around forty uh, 74,000 doses across the, the practices that we worked with, which is a very small net saving. So it's not, this is not groundbreaking stuff. It's only around 100K in public sector costs. But I think what is really interesting here, um, so some of you might remember that a couple of years ago, was a target set to reduce the unnecessary prescribing rates by 1% uh, across the whole of GP practices in England. Now, uh, 23 million pounds was assigned to that target. So 23 million pounds put into a budget specifically to reduce uh, prescription rates. Now, this intervention got almost there, so 0.85 cent reduction, and it only cost 10K. It's just an incredibly powerful intervention low cost, easy to scale. And I think if, uh, if we were able to follow this up and, and, uh, and you know, continue it across all GP practices, we might see a really exciting, uh, really exciting impact. Okay, last one. Um, so the next or the final bucket of, of sort of ideas that we like to think about is making things as highly as possible. Um, and so again, a few things that we can think about here. So again, economists, I won't talk to you too much about future discounting, uh, but of course that's something we can try to tackle in our interventions, particularly thinking about if then statements, implementation intentions, all of that good stuff. And again, of course, helping people plan in advance. But actually, I think the thing that is probably simplest and most powerful is intervening when people are most likely to be, in fact, uh, be receptive to it. So at the point at which I'm making the decision, that's when I need the intervention. Um, there's a reason that impulse purchases are at the front of tills um, when, we, when we are shopping, because that's the point at which we've got our wallet out or our phone out, we're ready to pay, let's stick something extra on our basket. So intervening at the point at which people are most likely to be receptive, they can change their behavior, can be very, very powerful. Yeah. Yes, just one question. It's related to um, the trial um, for the prescription of antibiotics mm -hmm. from Raphael. The question is, could oh, the sorry, impact? No, I can't see no, the no, chat, but uh, it adapts with the time, the timely uh, option mm -hmm. now. Uh, the question is precisely: Wouldn't the effect be higher, for example, if the letters would be sent in December? Yeah, they really would. It would have been really neat to have done that. Um, we. <laughs> Are at the mercy of funding, of logistics, of all of that. But I'm not sure who asked the question. I can't see faces. But um, thank you, Raphael. Absolutely right. Um, it would have been effective. It would have been more effective. I think what we hope, what we hope, is that that um, even just putting the idea into people's heads at that point um, in September before that really heavy prescribing rate starts, that we do start to see some reduction. And we did, of course, because then we saw the. Can I go back? Yeah, and so we did see that reduction, but if we'd have managed to start there, we might have really intervened at the point that it's most chunky, but we weren't able to do it like that, unfortunately. Um, okay, oh, no, I'd... there we go. Okay, so um, to talk to timeliness and intervening at, at a sort of useful time, um, I'm going to share my sort of final study. Um, so this is around reducing waiting time for specialist medical care. So for eight outpatients appointments, basically. 
Um, and we did this study quite a while ago. We're now working with the NHS to reduce backlog, of course. Um, and so some of these ideas have come sort of back into our, our toolbox um, as we think about how we might reduce the extraordinary outpatient backlog. Um, but at the time of, of doing this, this study, we looked at why um, patients were waiting such a long time to be referred for a knee appointment or referred uh, for, for specialist care. And we found that actually one of the things that was sort of inherently fixable um, was that GPs at the point of referral found it quite difficult to identify the services with the shortest waiting times. So they had good intentions. They wanted to refer patients to somewhere they might be seen quickly, but it was quite tricky to, to work out which clinics that might be. And when we looked at the, the sort of IT and the digital infrastructure they were working with, it became really obvious. Um, so you can see here, this is the list of outpatient um, clinics. So list of services in blue here. And they're ordered geographically. So the top one there is only seven miles away from the, the GP's office. And uh, that sort of goes in, in ascending order. And so that, that sort of feels logical, except when you're operating in a system where services have extremely long wait times. Um, so again, we did a few very simple things, not rocket science. Uh, we moved the clinics or the outpatient clinics that had the shortest wait lists to the top and put them in green. Uh, we then highlighted the services with very long wait lists um, with these sort of red limited capacity boxes. Um, and then we also added a pop-up. So if the GP, and they had come to refer their patient, if the GP decided to override or to, to um, refer to one of these sort of red box uh, clinics, they received this pop-up. And they could absolutely override this. So I don't know if a patient particularly liked an outpatient clinic or they really were set, they'd been before, they wanted to, to go back. They could override. But what we were doing was intervening at the point of decision trying to shape the, in this case, IT environment to encourage the behavior that we were looking for. Um, and of course, oh, we've got some in the waiting rooms over here. Um, and of course, we found this to be incredibly effective. Um, so we saw um, a reduction in the number of um, referrals to those really long waiting lists uh, by around 38%. Uh, which is incredibly exciting. And again, super simple, not rocket science, a change to the infrastructure. Um, GPs barely noticed. It was something that was quite smooth to put in. And if scaled up, could be incredibly effective, I think. Okay, so designing public policy around behavior. If we want to encourage uh, a policy, a behavior, and want to encourage people to do something, we need to make it easy, attractive, social, and timely. I'm going to stop there. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions, either online or in the room. Happy to speak to any of the trials that I've spoken to, or we can talk about our general approach to policy, or also happy to do career chat if that's helpful. Um, but I will stop there. Thank you. I guess that we can take some questions. Um, I mean, I have one myself. I mean, one referring to the prescription errors. Um, I mean, my my feeling sometimes is that some of these interventions, like, they really. Uh, Tackle processes. Yes. Right? So the question is whether they change outcomes, and this is like the biggest mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, the, the bigger picture sort of debate. No, I mean like the bigger big picture question. No? Uh, there's been like all these meta analyses about the effect of behavioral interventions using much, mm -hmm. and they often find like a, an effect, but that is not yeah. spectacular. Yeah, it's an eight percentage point increase is the average. Yeah. Right. And 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 my 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 question for you would be whether that is the result of perhaps all these interventions focusing a lot on the processes, which are very important. I mean, it could be that, you know, maybe we should not, I mean, health economists or health policy people, we tend to focus too much on the outcomes mm. and we tend to ignore the processes. And that's kind of a second order question that on yeah. the margin you care about. Yeah, really yeah, focus. yeah. So my, my, my question for you is how, how important yeah, the process is. Great question. It's a great question. Um, and I think a fair critique that's often levied at, at this type of work um, I guess the rebuttal I would, well, the rebuttal I would have is twofold. So um, we can also apply this kind of thinking to like big systems change. So for example, I haven't spoken to it today, but we um, have a very good portfolio of work in obesity prevention. We are involved in designing the sugar tax. 
Um, that is an incredibly behaviorally designed um, tax, right? So focus is exactly where you want to be, targets the manufacturers, um, and we know that it's taken around 30% of sugar out of people's diets. Extraordinary. Oh, sorry, out of fizzy drink drinkers' diets. Um, so extraordinary. So you can apply this type of thing to systems and like bigger picture stuff. Um, just haven't spoken to it today. Um, but also the second thing I would say, um, specific to the NHS and to kind of clinical health and health systems, is that actually sometimes that big systemic stuff and the outcomes piece is so difficult to tackle that we often end up doing nothing. So we are working on backlog, we're also thinking about staff retention. And those are big issues of pay, satisfaction, all of that big stuff that is quite difficult to tackle. Whereas some of this stuff we can just get on with. Um, and so often we find doing something is better than nothing, um, which is why getting at the processes makes a tiny difference. And it is tiny, you're right. Uh, but tiny applied at scale can be really impactful um, and sort of better than nothing. Yeah, that's, that's the way we think of it. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, under the EAST model, do you find that there's any interventions that work particularly well in combination? Have you tried that or have they been sort of isolated, you know, technical, timely interventions? What have you found to be the interplay between them? Yeah, interesting. Um, I would say it's very rare that we only use one. Uh, we only sort of focus on one thing. So the way we tend to work is that we start with the target behavior we then do a heap of what we call explore work so which is basically research so qualitative look at data do some ethnographic research and then we identify all the barriers to the behavior we're looking to encourage and then we typically throw everything at it so it's very rare these are deliberately selected examples because they're quite focused um it's very rare that we would um not have those things into play um i think Oh, I'm trying to think of one of my favourites that crosses a few. Okay, yeah, so one of my favourites is a, a piece that we have only just published, um, I can share if it's of interest, um, is again in the obesity prevention space, which is my background. Um, and we designed, uh, basically designed a Just Eat or a delivery platform. So we designed it, we then simulated nudges within it um, to discourage excessive calorie purchasing. Um, and we were able to play around with almost all of the ideas um, in this uh, in the East framework and found that the combination of ideas is most effective. So if you can make it super easy to choose the right thing, stick the healthy stuff at the top, make it the default, whatever. Um, if you can make calories really salient, so you put them right at the beginning ahead of price, interestingly, uh, we found that to be increasingly effective. We found if you chuck a social norms message in there, so I mean, really, everything you can think of, the more layered you can make it, the more impactful you can have. And actually, there was a, a sort of cumulative effect of that. So they were more than the sum of their parts, if you like, um, which is, yeah, super interesting. And what was really nice with that study um, <laughs> is that we found you could reduce the calories purchased, but you could keep the price, the, the amount that people spent uh, consistent so they were just choosing different things but still spending the same amount which less of a concern for me as a health person big concern for the industry right so if I'm trying to convince industry to reconfigure their apps to support health and sustainability and good choices when it comes to food they need to know their profit margins are safe and we were able to protect that um, yeah super interesting I can share it it's on Twitter but I can share it if it's helpful yeah that'd be good yeah. thank yeah. you no of course um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ellen, uh, for joining us in the name of the Health Society here at LSC. I would like to ask you two, two questions or two or three questions. Um, first of all, you have um, studies uh, on the adoption, for example, on digital health at the NHS for um, care workers. Um, I, don't, I don't know. And in that context, wouldn't it be smart to have, for example, the digital system of the NHS be designed with precisely the, the intentions of being as able to put in places or facilitate behavioral trials? Mm -hmm. And you're just mentioning, sorry for, uh, for all. No, this is great. 
But um, a lot of digital apps today, half apps, use or try processing to put in place behavioral um, cognitive therapy, for example. Yeah. How do you see the effectiveness of this? Because there's a the trial, and the, these apps have been here already for some years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that's it. Um, but I, I would also ask, what is do you think is the place of big tech companies precisely in this field since they may have some data not all <laughs> yeah i so it's always like you can see inside my brain um health tech is i think the next big place where we should be applying these type of techniques um we have started to see so people have been using health apps for years right but i think covid was the first scenario in which everybody or, or a greater proportion of the population access the NHS app, for example. And so I think this is a really opportune moment to think about, okay, well, how can we use that app that most people now have on their phone? So my mum now has the NHS app on her phone, or she would never have anything like that previously. And so how can we use that, the data that it produces, but also the touch points that we now have to really give health advice, to make sure people are turning up to their appointments, make sure they're collecting their prescriptions, all of those things. Um, I think it's a really critical juncture in, in that development. Um, you are specifically around digital for care workers. Is that, can you elaborate on um, The adoptions yeah, of digital I don't know, tools uh, yeah. that may be developed, since we know that sometimes the adoption of these new technologies mm. for health workers and not only yeah. may uh, we sometimes have some difficulties on the yeah. way for different reasons, of course. Yeah, right. So I guess it depends on the industry. So we just finished a piece of work with Imperial, um, working with nurses to encourage use of the electronic scanners. Um, so when a nurse is um, taking you know, those big trolleys that they take around, um, so taking around big trolleys, dishing out medication, they, they need to encourage them to use these scanners that are on their phones as opposed to doing a manual sort of tick out for the um, medication. And actually we came across some really heavy resistance to that. Um, some nurses were just really traditional. They didn't like uh, the use of tech in a ward. They didn't feel it was appropriate. But actually the biggest barrier that we found um, was that people either didn't understand how to use it and they hadn't had sufficient training um, and they didn't they didn't feel confident so they worried that it was going to be incorrect so i think there's a piece around uh reassuring people that tech can be reliable it can be safe your data are protected um that kind of stuff so i think there's something there but then also we we found that um there was some interesting disincentive so if uh if they tried to scan and it failed it showed up as a failed medication and so that was a really simple it thing we could just fix um, and so it's really about digging into the behavior and identifying, okay, what are the barriers? Why don't people want to do this? And how can we fix that? Because often it's something really daft. We also found that the trolley, uh, in, order to use, in order to use the electronic scanner, they had to keep the trolley plugged in and then they could only take it so far. So I couldn't take the trolley all the way to you. So I'd have to park the trolley here, then move to you to give you your medication in your, like as a patient in your bed, then come back to the trolley, just incredibly inefficient. So there were some like tiny frictions that are completely fixable um, that we had to tackle. So yes, digital is the answer. Uh, yes, I think there is enormous opportunity for use within the healthcare sector. And yes, there's some like barriers to be overcome is my summary to your very eloquent question. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Do you ever get any sort of backlash from a sort of ethical point of view? I think the failure is like libert libertarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The idea of people's behaviours being changed. And also, I guess, from that, how do you know that you, I mean, maybe in some of these examples, it's more obvious than others, but how do you know that you're um, sort of pushing the right behaviour? I mean, who's sort of making that judgment call? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so, great. So I'm going to add on one more. Yeah, please do. Sort of maybe from a sort of slightly more dark logic point of view, do you how do you how are you sort of making sure that the behaviors you're trying to influence aren't having unintended consequences? Like, did you find, I mean, were you measuring whether more people were attending A &E because they hadn't had their sort of bacterial infections treated properly? Yeah. Um, yes, that's an excellent question, and one I think we almost always get asked. Um, it's really valid. 
And actually one of my concerns when I joined the team, like, are we doing the right thing here? Are we using science in the right way? A um, couple of things. So first of all, um, in all these interventions, we always maintain the element of choice. So for example, on the GP referral, GPs can always override any of the nudges that are applied. So these are very soft nudges that do influence behavior, but can be over overridden. So I do the, the sort of freedom of choice remains. Um, albeit in the in the environment that is moving people towards a specific behavior. In, in regards to are we doing the right thing? So we have um, an internal ethics committee, um, which is incredibly rigorous, has senior academic stakeholders, senior policy government, and um, also uh, charity stakeholders. And any project that comes through has to meet a very strict set of criteria. So we think those things through. Is this the type of behaviour we want to encourage? What do we think uh, any unintended consequences might be? Are there backlash? Uh, you know, is there a risk of backlash here or backfire? Um, and so that all goes through before we get anywhere near any of this stuff. Then if we think, OK, so in the case of the um, antimicrobial resistance, for example, if we think, OK, this is broadly the right thing but there could be backfire we just make sure to measure that and that's why we we have a very short feedback loop on any of our interventions so usually we would only work with routinely collected data so we get it immediately we can analyze quickly and then turn an intervention around um so we do really think about that because it's not uh i guess it's not a responsibility to be taken lightly some of this stuff um and as always you know, the Daily Mail headlines write themselves often, uh, which is frustrating, but I think sometimes if you're trying to do something good, you're, you're bound to piss off a few people. Um, yeah, but I feel comfortable with what we're doing. Great. Other questions? Yep. Yeah. And I want to ask for your team uh, in the practical application, what kind of application have already used in uh, real world and uh, what will you want to do? Uh, what's the focus right now? What's our focus moving forward? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So we've got six. So my my team has four, I guess, sort of buckets of work that we focus on. Um, and then a few that we're hoping to move into. Um, so two of the buckets focus on the NHS and on social care. So we're going to launch the work in that space, uh, particularly at the moment around backlog and staff retention. Um, but then we have an enormous portfolio of work um, on public health and prevention. So lots of work on obesity prevention, smoking cessation, reducing harm from alcohol and drugs, uh, risky sexual behaviours, anything in that sort of preventative behaviour space. Um, and then, of course, the sort of the fourth bucket is um, an enormous portfolio on vaccination. So we have historically done a lot on COVID. Uh, that's sort of moving away now, but we still retain quite a few projects with focused on MMR and other childhood immunization, uh, HPV vaccination, particularly in low middle income countries, um, and, uh, and, and in trying to dispel or tackle misinformation around vaccination. So we do a lot of that kind of public engagement work there as well. Um, so those are the kind of things that we're doing currently. The things that we're not yet doing, or we've they've gone on the back burner that we'd like to reinvigorate. Um, a lot of there's a lot of potential for this stuff in women's health, um, particularly with respect to maternal health and also uh, women entering the menopause. I think there's a, a lot of potential there, so that's something we're looking at at the moment. Um, AMR remains a really important strand of work for us, so that's that's something we're focused on. Digital is one of I'm thinking of the six strands of work that are future focused. Digital is another one, um, and then we have a few others that are. Are sort of very focused on NHS and other government priorities. Um, so lots of work looking forward, um, but all comes under that bucket of either prevention or healthcare and health systems um, work. Yeah. Right. I, mean, I have a couple of questions myself. I mean, one is um, on the study of prescriptions of inappropriate prescriptions. Mm. I mean, one 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 thing that strikes me is whether um, you see any you know, uh, unintended effects. Like for instance, people might stop, I mean, physicians might stop prescribing antibiotics, but they might start preparing other things. That, uh, so for instance, uh, we, we did a paper in Korea 
where uh, we basically, well, what they did in Korea is that they listed uh, the 25% of top uh, antibiotic misprescribers in the country, right? So, and people- Oh, found... published it? Yeah, so I shamed, oh. I shamed the list. So I'm sort of a name and shame. Uh, I mean, okay. Yeah. And of course, that was in, in a country where shame is really, yeah. really a big deal. Yeah. Uh, that worked. Uh, yeah. People change behaviors, but the problem is that they ended up prescribing, uh, you know, medicine, you know, drugs that, that actually were not supposed to. So actually, oh, okay. it didn't save much money to the country because I mean, you're assuming here that, that there are savings, yeah. right? That come out that come only from in the physicians not prescribing antibiotics, but if they end up prescribing other things that were yeah. not of yeah. particular use, yeah. and that might cancel out. Those, yeah, and of course the savings. intention, the intention with um, the sort of reducing AMR portfolio is not to save money really. It's right. about ensuring that we reduce, reduce the harm caused by right. AMR. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and the, the second point is more about spillovers, more generally. So, for instance, when it comes to vaccination, I mean, we know there is this effect that when people get people that, that got the COVID vaccine, for instance, they were all more overconfident because, you know, yeah, I'm vaccinated. No? I mean, that there is this overconfidence bias. Yeah. And now I take more risks out there, right? Yeah. So all this, I mean, the director is more around spillover effects. No? I mean, like yeah. all these interventions are evaluated on, only on, on the, what you said, the intended effects when the antibiotics would be the harm, right? Mm -hmm. But there are always like spillover effects that often don't get... Yeah. Don't get really looked into them. Uh, so that's what the economists are distinguish between partial yeah. equilibrium and general equilibrium effects. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. most of these RCTs they focus on the partial equilibrium effects, but yeah. there are other general yeah. equilibrium effects that, that get missed. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally fair. I think I mean the short answer is that we evaluate as much as we're funded to evaluate. Right. Um, so we work. We have no central funding, and so we are commissioned by government and charities to do specific projects. And so, what we are often able to, well, I mean, we always shape those proposals, so we can usually push to um, evaluate as much of that spillover sort of effect as possible. And we all start with a theory of change, so exactly as you would in academia, um, we start with that and then evaluate as much as possible. But you're right, there's always things that are missed. Um, specifically with COVID, I think. I think the challenge there with the idea of, okay, well, I'm vaccinated, so I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to change my behaviour and perhaps shield less or, you know, not follow guidelines, whatever, is that I would still argue that the risk of not being vaccinated outweighs that risk of additional transmission. So I think in that case, I feel pretty comfortable. Um, but it's, it, you're right, the spillover effects are difficult to, to get to. And if you can't evaluate all of that or follow up for a long period of time, then you, you do miss them. Um, and I think that is where, where it's challenging, right? So we yeah. don't have unlimited funding. Yeah, you yeah, just can't yeah. evaluate that stuff. Um, I mean, another example is wearing a helmet. I mean, like um, yeah, was, right. the government was, was evaluating whether helmet you should be made compulsory or not. And basically the problem there is that people that wear a helmet, they, 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 they speak. Uh, when the, the, they cycle more speedily and they take more risks, so it could well yeah. be that you are saving, uh, you know, yeah. cost on 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 the probability of of, yeah. a, of an accident happening. Actually, if 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 the accident happens anyway and they speed, yeah. maybe that the consequence to the NHS is, is a higher cost yeah. altogether, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's unclear. I mean, you know, without the the, the spillovers, it's unclear whether you're yeah. really finding. And difficult to get to that really. What a really quantitative economic argument and that cost benefit analysis, right? Um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, we try. So, with all of our studies, we part of part of the criteria through which we decide we're going to do something is we have to, in theory, be able to get it to a quality. So, we need to be able to say, if scaled, this project or this intervention or this idea could save X point. Um, and so, we try to get somewhere near that economic argument, but it's Related with assumptions, yeah. Um, and often we're you know 27 steps away. Um, yeah, it's tricky. I don't know whether we have another comment or is it a question in the chat? Can, can you read it? Or is it the same thing that there is a there's uh, questions, but I don't know whether uh, great talk. Just a question about your thoughts on the NHS plans oh, for yeah, that... pharmacies to prescribe antibiotics. Even the existing problems with our right? I mean, is, is that a question? I, that, that, that is a question from Kaylee. Yeah. So we I'll haven't really that. challenged that. We haven't, we haven't answered that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Kaylee, thank you. 
don't know who I'm speaking to. Really um, <laughs> thank you, Kaylee. Um, yeah, really interesting. So for anyone who's not aware, um, was in the news this morning, the NHS have a plan to allow pharmacists to prescribe um, sort of common uh, common ailments, prescriptions for minor illnesses, so sore throat, um, huge eyes, that kind of thing. Um, I think it could be really impactful um, if it was carefully thought through and resourced. I think the challenge is that pharmacists have similar levels of backlog, similarly under-resourced and overburdened. And so I've got a mini fear that we're just pushing a problem from one place to another. Um, but I do think it could be really interesting. Um, and if you could make it, you know, you're, it's classic BI, right? So you're making it easier for patients to get hold of prescriptions. You're not taking up uh, a GP appointment where it's not necessary. Could be really effective. But if pharmacists aren't supported, um, it could be just sort of kicking the can down the road. Um, yeah, there's a, another question, Alison. Yes, Alison. Uh, so you mentioned the behavioural science can be incentivising women to... Oh, interesting. Okay, I'd love people, if you feel comfortable, I don't know um, who that's from, but if you feel comfortable to jump off mute and, and talk to that, that would be great. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're, yeah, what you're thinking there. Yeah. Um, um... No, you, would, you were talking about how behavioral science can be used, incentives can be used for women's health, um, maternal health, women's mm -hmm. health, and, and them entering the medical profession. And so I'm wondering what behavioral science incentives or biases or um, tactics you would use to incentivize uh, people towards a certain profession or specialty. Yeah, that is really interesting. Thank you, um, voice from the ceiling. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think that is interesting. Um, specifically encouraging women into the medical profession. I think I would want to, well, I would want to start very early in shaping our educational system and the structures in which girls find themselves um, to ensure that they are not systemically discouraged from STEM subjects. Um, so, for example, there's a really neat study that is utterly depressing that showed if girls, so when girls are doing a maths and science test, if they are asked to identify themselves as a girl uh, at the beginning of the test, they perform much worse in that test. So we have this horrible inherent um, societal norm that women tend to you know, be discouraged from, from STEM subjects. So I think part of, I would just go way back before we even get to universities and, and professional organisations um, and think about how we can structure the education system to support uh, girls in, in sticking with those types of subjects. Um, if you go on our website, we have an entire education team that is dedicated to exactly that. So gender inequalities in computing, in STEM subjects, um, and, and particularly thinking about how behavioural science can be applied. Um, I think then thinking later, I think there are also some systemic issues that need to be addressed. So for example, we've just finished a trial with nurses and we found differential effects for men and women that showed if you can allow nurses to self-roster, so to organize their own schedule um, and therefore have a little bit more flexibility in work, we see a much greater retention rate and higher staff satisfaction rate. And we saw that increasing, we saw that sort of differentially effective for women. Um, who typically have greater care and responsibility. So I think there are some systemic stuff you can do at the process end, and then there's also some like big, heavy societal stuff we need to do um, at the education end. Um, I mean, that was like 13 seconds of what is a massive conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Which I'd love to have with you, but um, yeah, I'm conscious we're at time. <laughs> we're at time. Yes, I, I, I'll have to go, actually. So I, I, I think that... Um, Unless there is a final question, let's thank the presenter, uh, uh, Helen. That was a fantastic talk, and, uh, and uh, you have the email there. To yeah, please do get in touch. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, uh, thank everyone in the audience, everyone at home. Uh, I see that somebody is joining just now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, well, thank you to the Health Society for organizing this event. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and Hugo particularly on the logistics. So let's let's thank the presenter in the first place and everyone else.